and to the uh, retreat that we were doing for the group in Rimini, Italy. I got some text messages, but then this morning I got some information that told me that that was under control and taken care of. So I feel much better because that was something that was bothering me during the week that, that uh, I tried to announce it as best I could. I did the best I could. But uh, I guess for some, it fell through the cracks. We will not be interrupted in our Saturday seminars that I'm aware of until the OA birthday in January. And that'll be the weekend of Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. And we will, I will be doing the uh, big book for the OA birthday. So that will be, I will be doing that all day Saturday. I believe that's the 16th of January and then the morning of the 17th of January. And unfortunately that will be on Zoom. I was looking forward to seeing so many of you in Los Angeles this January as we do every year. But unfortunately because of COVID that will be interrupted. We are in the chapter, We Agnostics. And we are talking about the hardest step to talk about and the hardest step to present, the hardest step to talk about is always step number two. It brings up things in people that other steps just do not bring up. When we talk about step one, putting down the food, that may be difficult, but it doesn't usually create emotional turmoil. It doesn't usually create all kinds of emotional uh, residual situations. When we talk about different steps, it's more mechanical. Here's how you do the step. Here's how you don't do the step, things like that. But step two is a step I hate talking about actually, but it is necessary because step two is one of the steps. There's two steps that are very underutilized in OA. Two and 10, and the most misunderstood are three and four. Step two can be difficult because not only are there people who have very hostile attitudes toward God, but there are people that will use that hostility as a justification for behaviors that either are directly eating or lead to eating. In other words, resentments and fears that can run unchecked. So this is something that we need to talk about, we must talk about, and I'm gonna do the best I can to walk the fine line between the sponsor presenting step two and the sponsee who may be struggling with it. I'm gonna do the best I can. What is an agnostic? Now, I, I want to review a little today because we did miss out last week. What is an agnostic? And there are many of you, and I don't know, you know who's what, there are many of you who have an absolute belief in God. You go to synagogue, you go to church, you go to the mosque, you, you, you have a belief in a power greater than yourself. And for many, that is a religious deity, but it doesn't have to be. We are not here to preach religion. We are not here to sell on a religion. We are not here to disparage religion. And we are not here to convince people that religion is either good or bad or applicable or inapplicable. That's not our purpose in OA at all. We take no position on such things. And a person who is an atheist, he or she believes that there is no God. There is no deity in the sky, if you will. They believe that there is no God. That things happen because they happen and that they're there's just no God, and that's an atheist. So we have the believers and we have the atheists. Now we have the agnostic. What is an agnostic? Ag means without. Gnostic means knowledge. Agnostic means without knowledge. In other words, we don't know. We're not quite sure if there is one or if there is not one. And for me, I came in with an absolute belief that there was a God, but that God was going to screw me over because I couldn't be thin like the other boys. I was deformed and emasculated both emotionally and physically. By the time I was about 12 years old, this disease 
had me and it was deforming me and making me the butt of jokes, making me an object of ridicule, making me the target for every wisecracker within a 50 mile radius and making my life a living hell. My life did not match up, as yours didn't, with what I saw on TV. I wanted Rob and Laura Petrie for parents, and I got Max and Virginia Grabowski. I got something very, very different. My mother and father didn't sing songs in the living room and dance and do all those things. They didn't do any of those things. My mother and father fought incessantly. And my mother and father were not independent financially at all. My mother and father were, my father was an immigrant and my mother was mentally ill. My mother had three distinct personalities screaming, raving lunatic, three-year-old, two-year-old kind of child, and a pretty together person. You never knew what you were going to get, how long it was going to last, or where it was going to go. And it was embarrassing, and it was also quite debilitating for me. So I grew up with this idea that God was there for uh, the wars and he was there for big things and he might have been there for certain other people who seemed in my mind's eye to be very favored by God. I was not one of those people. And at the same time, I didn't realize, yes, I was, because I was going to survive where many, many died along the way and that I had friends and my friends were there for me. I didn't have aunts, uncles, brothers, cousins. I didn't have any of that stuff. I didn't have grandparents or any of that stuff, but I had wonderful, wonderful, loving, caring friends. And I still do today. Many of them are the same people. And many of them are the new people that I meet all the time in OA. And they're all precious to me in one way or another. Agnostic means without knowledge. Now, some of you may pin the needle on the believer side. Some of you may pin the needle on the atheist side. But there may be pockets, there may be pockets of your life where you are agnostic, whether you be a believer or an atheist, you may not have enough knowledge to really bring God into that part of the equation. And that's why over and over again, we are taught by the big book to practice these principles. What are the principles? The principles are the steps to practice these principles in all of our affairs. It says on page 45 of the big book of AA that the main purpose of this book is to help you find a power greater than yourself, which will solve your problem. And if, it, if that's the main object of this book, it better be the main object of my life is to find that power greater than myself, which will solve my problem. And so the agnostic is presented in the book by saying, we agnostics. Notice Bill didn't title the chapter, those agnostics. He didn't title the chapter, you agnostics. He didn't title the chapter, the agnostics. He titled the chapter, we agnostic, because we work at step two. We came to believe, which means we work at it constantly. I have relationships with some of you on the line today that go back decades, four or five decades. We work at the relationship. It doesn't say we believed that there was a power greater than ourselves that could restore us to sanity. It says we came to believe. In Bill's story, Bill says, I might build what I have in my friend. Would I have it? Of course I would. It doesn't say, would I take what I have with my friend? Or would I share what I have with my friend? It said, I would build what I had with my friend, meaning there's going to be work involved. And I get this call all the time by sponsees and sponsors struggling with step two. And this question comes up, how do I believe? You start 
by starting. You start by having a conversation. If I was going to date a woman right now, how would I start? I'd say, hey, let's go for coffee. And we'd go for coffee and we'd have a conversation. And I'd learn a little bit about her and she'd learn a little bit about me. And that's where it starts. It's the same thing with God. So you may be thinking, well, I can't bring God to a coffee house. No, but you don't have to. You can start by acting as if. And how do I act as if? I pray, even though I may not mean it. Even though I don't feel it in my heart, it's a starting point. And let's say you're an atheist. Well, are you Mother Nature? Are you responsible for puppies? and mountains, and Lake Michigan? Are you responsible for, for all the wonderment that we see around us? It was here thousands of years before you were born. It'll be here 20,000 generations after you're gone. So are, are, did you create it? No. So somewhere in your mind, somewhere in your mind, in your um, the Yiddish word of the day is going to be neshuma. Neshuma. And the neshuma is that spirit, that holiness that rests within you. Right here, right here, there's a connection between this and this, the heart and the head. Somewhere within you, you can fathom that there might be a power of this universe greater than you. You don't have to call that God. You don't have to call it anything. You don't have to have a religious old man beard in the sky image of that God. You just have to have an awareness or a willingness, excuse me, not an awareness, a willingness to believe that there is indeed a power greater than you. There is a power greater than you. That's all that is required to make a beginning. You do not have to be a, 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 a regular at church. You do not have to be a regular at synagogue, the mosque, or the, the temple, or whatever it is. All it takes is a willingness to believe that there is a power greater than yourself. And so I have pockets of agnosticism. I am now convinced that God will enable me to get through any day without excess food as long as I'm willing to do the work. But will he bring me a wife? I don't know. So I'm going to work at that. Will he bring me a retirement? I don't know. So I'm going to work at that. Will he, whatever that may be. Now, he's not, gonna, he's not Santa Claus. This is my God. This doesn't have to be your God. He's not Santa Claus. I'm not going to make out a list. Let's see. I want a Ferrari. Got to have a Ferrari. And uh, well, maybe for the weekdays, I'll also get a Mercedes. Ferrari, Mercedes. Got to have a mansion. Got to have a big mansion. Uh, $20 million. He's not Santa Claus. He's not Santa Claus. And he's not the tooth fairy. This is my interpretation. It doesn't have to be yours. I am not here to tell you what God is. I'm not here to tell you what God isn't. I'm just telling you what doesn't work for me. And it doesn't work for me to sit with a pencil and a paper and make a list of what I want and think that that's what's going to happen. Because so many times God has a better idea. Now, what we're going to be talking about today, catching us up today, is we left off on page 52. We left off on page 52. And the, the place that we left off on is the bedevilments we had to ask ourselves. And, and that was where I deliberately wanted to stop. Because today, we are going to talk about the bedevilments. And I want to smash one of the myths one of the expressions that you hear in OA all the time. And that expression is abstinence is the most important thing in my life without exception. No, it's not. No, it's not. Because these bedevilments will bedevil me in abstinence if I'm not working a spiritual program. You see, before I ever came to OA, 
I used to go to a bowling alley in Skokie, Illinois, and in the basement, they had a group called Tops, Take Off Pounds Sensibly. I don't think they have that anymore. I haven't heard of Tops in 50 years, 40 years. But they had a group called Tops, came out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I went down there and I lost a lot of weight. Now I was a champion weight loser because I had so much to lose, obviously. And I went to Weight Watchers and I did lose weight with AIDS, A-Y-D-S, trying to market a, a product like that. Only if you're old like me, do you remember lose weight with AIDS? And then there was Metrical, I think, and there was all kinds of chazerai. Chazerai is Yiddish for garbage. There was all kinds of chazerai. And I know that there's at least three of us here this morning. We went to meetings with somebody that had a staple put in their ear by an acupuncturist, and they were supposed to pull their ear like Carol Burnett when they wanted food. And I think they forgot to do that a couple of times. And then there were people that I sat in meetings with in Ravenswood Hospital and in Swedish Covenant Hospital that had the urine of pregnant women shot up their keister and they paid big money for that and the diet pills and all the rest of it. When I'm not eating, I'm miserable because people told me, don't eat so much, you'll feel better. Boy, they were right. When I don't eat so much and I'm not working a program, I feel anger better, I feel fear better, I feel jealousy better, crushes on girls better, I feel lots of things much, much better. And I'm not from the suicide group as much as I am from the homicide group. So when I'm not eating and I'm not working a spiritual program, I am not a very nice guy to be around. I'm really not. And if you want to look at some of these guys that are alcoholics and they're not working much of a program, but they're not drinking, they're dry drunks. Man, some of those guys are miserable. They're just miserable, miserable people. They're angry and they're scared and they're just miserable. So when we hear abstinence is the most important thing in, in our lives without exception, remember that the spiritual program of action is the most important thing without exception. And I'm just gonna go back to page 14 and I'm going to look at page 14 and I'm gonna read to you, 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 if you have your big book in front of you, on the bottom of page 14, it says, my friend had emphasized the absolute necessity of demonstrating these principles in all my affairs. What are the principles? The principles are the steps. Particularly was it imperative, imperative means it's important before all else, to work with others as he had worked with me. Faith without works was dead, he said, and how appallingly true for the alcoholic, for if an alcoholic failed to perfect and enlarge his spiritual life, through work and self-sacrifice for others, he could not survive the certain trials and low spots ahead. If he did not work, he would surely drink again. If he drank, he would surely die. Then faith would be dead indeed. With us, it is just like that. So the most important thing in my life, without exception, is to have that relationship with the power greater than myself that translates into working with other people because that's how I perfect and enlarge my spiritual life. So let's take two things we said today and join them together. I said to you a little while ago that the thesis line of the book is on page 45. <sighs> And that line says, the main object of this book is to help you find a power greater than yourself, which will solve your problem. And then I just said to you that the most important thing is to work with other people. In working with other people, I, I give credibility to that 
building of a relationship with my higher power. That's how I perfect and enlarge my spiritual life through service and self-sacrifice for others. That is specifically how I do it. I could sit in the synagogue and pray all day. It would make the rabbi very happy. I could sit in a church and pray all day. The priest or the minister would be probably thrilled. But if I do not take that action of working with others, I do not take action to get out of myself, my relationship with God is going to be very, very limited. Very limited. I must take this faith and by taking that faith out into the world, that's how I demonstrate these principles. St. Francis of Assisi is not usually quoted by fat Jewish boys from Devon Avenue, but I'm going to take a plunge of faith here. St. Francis of Assisi was a Catholic Jesuit priest, and he said, preach the gospel, and if you must, use words. So let's paraphrase. Preach the big book, and if you must, use words. The greatest way, I get this call all the time, many of you do too, I've got a friend, I've got a daughter, I've got a son, I've got a cousin, I've got a next door neighbor, they're dying in the disease, what do I do for them? Let them see what this program is doing for you. Be that example of the big book that they're looking for. There's three things you can do today for the person who is still sick and suffering. The three things are, you may want to write this down, recover, recover, and recover. Those are the three things you can do. So the main object of this book is to help you find a power greater than yourself, which will solve your problem. And the, the page 14 tells me that what is absolutely imperative is to work with others. One leads to the other. Notice nobody said anything about abstinence. I'm not saying that you can go out and eat baby Ruth bars and Reese's peanut butter cups and be of service. I can't. I am of no service to anyone with a stomach full of food. And the definition of pathetic for me is stomach full of food, head full of big book. That to me is pathetic for me. I'm not talking about for you. Stomach full of food, head full of big book equals pathetic. So let's go to page 52 and let's look at what it says here. We had to ask ourselves why we shouldn't apply our human problems, this same readiness to change our point of view. What does that mean? why we shouldn't change and why should we change because the wife as I knew it sucked the wazoo. I'm not quite sure what a wazoo is or how to suck one, but my life sucked the wazoo. So we were having trouble with our personal relationships. You bet I was. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that I was cruel to people or mean. It could mean that I was acquiescing codependently to others. And when I looked in the mirror, I saw their face. And I tried to respond how they would respond and act the way they wanted me to act and believe what they wanted me to believe so that they wouldn't abandon me. That's not being myself. That's not being a person that's in recovery. That's being codependent. I had trouble with personal relationships. I hung out with some lesser companions, figuring that's what I deserved. I also hung out, hung out with some really good people. Not everybody was a lesser companion. But the bottom line is, is that this is the first thing that they look at, and this is the first canary in the coal mine. We were having trouble with our personal relationships. Now, I do not want you to think I'm disparaging my ex-wife. I'm not. I'm not saying a bad word about her. I'm not saying anything about her. I'm talking about me. 
I married the first girl that came along that wanted to be married because I did not have enough faith in God or enough faith in myself that I would ever meet someone again. And I did everything in that marriage to cultivate her staying and she divorced me. How did I do that specifically? I let her make every decision and she loved that. I thought she did anyway, she didn't. That came out. I let her make every decision. If she wanted the green car and I wanted the red car, we got the green car. If she wanted to go east, I went east. If she wanted to go north, I went north. I did whatever she wanted me to do. I became a child scared of his mommy in the marriage. And I wanna remind you again, I am not disparaging my ex-wife. She should live and be well. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I am not being sarcastic here. I am, I'm mean that from the bottom of my heart. She should live and be well. But I was the little son scared to death of her. And I was willing to do anything to make her stay. And, and she divorced me anyway. So we were having trouble with our personal relationships. Some of my relationships were not friend relationships. They were hostage taking. Some of my situations were very, very sick and very, very bad. They were horrible. Was I having trouble with my personal relationships in this disease? You bet I was. We were having trouble with, excuse me, we couldn't control our emotional natures. How was I going to control my emotional nature when all I could think about was eating and not eating, eating and not eating? And now I want to remind you again, this is me, whether I'm eating or not, if I'm not working a spiritual program. If I'm working a spiritual program, these things start to improve. Because if you remember, we talked about how God doesn't use the word abstinence or sobriety in step two. He uses the word sanity. And sane people, you know, they can't control things by themselves, but we take steps like 10 to control our emotional natures. 10 levels me out, 11 levels me out, 12 levels me out. But if I don't have those steps, I'm unchecked. Not eating Reese's peanut butter cups is just a beginning. It is not the end result of recovery. The end result of recovery is I have to be in and working at a spiritual awakening. I never had a spiritual experience like Bill did. I had a spiritual awakening as the result of the steps, not a spiritual experience. A spiritual experience is sudden and profound. A spiritual awakening is slow in developing, and that's what I had. So if you want to know what's the difference, Awakening is slow and an experience is fast. That's all, that's, that's the difference. We were a prey to misery and depression, constantly a miserable person and depressed. Why? Because when I'm not eating, I'm absolutely miserable and I'm jealous. And the shortest distance between me and unhappiness is through the shortcut of comparison. There's a town in hell called Comparison. And when I go to Comparison first, that's the shortcut to hell. Okay? That's the shortcut to unhappiness. I never compare myself to other people when things are going well for me. I don't compare myself to other people when I'm riding high. I compare myself to other people when things are not going well. And when I'm not doing well and I compare myself to other people, I am always going to come out on the short end of the stick. They are lucky, I am unlucky. They are lucky and I'm unlucky. They have this and they have that and they go here and they go there. I used to complain constantly, my family never went on a vacation and I've never been on an airplane and I've never been here and I've never seen an ocean and I've never gone there. 
oh my God, I'm gold status on American Airlines now because of all the travel that I've done for OA. I've seen not just both oceans of, of Atlantic and Pacific, I've seen the Mediterranean Sea in Israel. I've seen both coasts. I've been everywhere. My God in heaven. I used to think that the coolest thing in the world is driving a car or riding on an airplane. I hate driving and I hate riding on airplanes now. I'm sick of it and I don't like to do it. Well, now, you know, you can still drive your car, obviously, but now with, with this corona, I mean, I'm not getting on an airplane anytime soon. Everything's canceled. All these retreats and all these conventions are on Zoom now. They're not happening in person. <sighs> but I have so many miles on American Airlines I'm gold status, number one. Number two, I could go from here to just about anywhere on the globe and it wouldn't cost me a nickel. Wouldn't cost me a nickel. But the shortest distance between me and unhappiness is through comparison. And that's why I'm a prey to misery and depression. We couldn't make a living. Now, for some, that's more acute than others. I've always been in commission sales. And when you're eating and obsessing about food and not dialing the phone, you're not going to make very much money. Some of you have done well financially. Some of you have the type of jobs where no matter whether you're eating or not, you are going to uh, be okay financially. But is your decision making trustworthy when you're in this disease? Is your personal relationships trustworthy when you're in this disease? So eventually at some point, a push is going to come to a shove. We had a feeling of uselessness. I was totally useless. I couldn't understand why people didn't want to listen to my advice. My life was a mess. I lived in a filth box. My apartment should have been condemned by the Board of Health. My, ho my house was full of pizza boxes and Twinkie wrappers. And, you know, uh, I told you the story about how these two people came to my house on February 2nd, 1979, to drag me kicking and screaming to a meeting of Overeaters Anonymous. Well, what is it that they had to kick away? They had to kick away Twinkie wrappers and Suzy Q wrappers and, and, and bags and boxes of candy and all kinds of stuff and pizzas. I had just ordered pizza. I used to order three pizzas at a time. I knew that one pizza wasn't enough for me. Are you kidding me? I used to order two, three, four pizzas at a time because I knew that one or two wasn't going to do it. And this woman came into my home and there were three large pizzas and she took them and threw them in a garbage can. Pissed me off. Pissed me off. We were full of fear. You bet I was full of fear. I feared everybody and everything. I feared sitting in a chair. I broke a lot of furniture. I feared going out because I was an object of ridicule. Things that, that have been screamed at me in supermarkets by children and the laughing that was done at me and people yelling things at me from cars, which make your hair stand on end. I often wondered to God through tears in my eyes, what felony spree had I engineered that condemned me to a life of this? What hell is this? What fresh hell is this? Now that I have to go out and buy clothes, and even though it says big and tall on the door, they often could not fit me with clothing. Don't let the fact that it's a big and tall plus size store fool you. There is a limit to the sizes that they have. There's a place on Dempster Street says big and tall, but they only went up to size 60. Wouldn't go on one of my feet. They only have up to 4X shirts. Wouldn't go on my hand. I had to go somewhere else. We were unhappy. The only thing that brought me happiness was the very thing that was killing me, and that was the food. Reese's peanut butter cups gave me about nine seconds of happiness. And those nine seconds, that effect 
that Dr. Silkworth talks about is what I chased to the gates of insanity or death. I chased it to the gates of insanity or death. Death was right around the corner. I was circling the drain, but I was absolutely insane. No sane person would do to themselves what I was doing, and I didn't know I had a disease. And people would say to me, you better get some discipline, young man, or you're going to die. And I would say to myself, I hope I die because I sure ain't got no discipline. I knew I couldn't live with the food and I knew I couldn't live without the food because the Lord knows I had been trying to diet from the time I was six years old. Elliot Epstein said to me on the schoolyard of Green School on Devon Avenue in Chicago, fatty, fatty, two by four, can't get through the kitchen door. And then he punched me in the nose and said, you're fat. And I was crying. And I said to myself, I'm going to lose weight. And I was six years old. And I never did lose the weight without OA. Not for very long. I lost I would get down to goal weight for about 15 minutes, but then I would go up again and then some. We could, was not a basic, oh sorry, we couldn't seem to be of real help to other people. Of course not. Was not a basic solution of these bedevilments more important than whether we should see newsreels of lunar flight? Of course it was. A solution to these bedevilments only comes to me through the 12 steps of Overeaters Anonymous out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it is the only way I have found them. If you can find them in another way, then I bless your path and I take my hat off to you. I have not found it in any other way, in any other, in any other direction. I wouldn't know what to do first. When we saw others solve their problems by a simple reliance upon the spirit of the universe, notice that spirit of the universe is in capital letters. He's talking about God. We had to stop doubting the power of God. Our ideas did not work, but the God idea did. In Bill's story, we are reminded how impactful that trip to Winchester Cathedral was on Bill. He mentions it several times. What did he see in Winchester Cathedral? What was so special about going to Winchester Cathedral? What he saw in Winchester Cathedral was the grave of a man named Thatcher. And his friend was Ebby Thatcher. He saw the grave of a man named Thatcher who was a, a Hampshire grenadier who caught his death drinking cold, small beer. A good soldier is near forgot whether he dieth by musket or by pot. In other words, the man drank himself to death. And this had a great impact on Bill because he didn't want to drink himself to death. Bill started drinking in 1918 and in 1934, December of 34, he will get sober for the final time. But what was Ebby presenting him? He was presenting him with a spiritual solution to his alcoholism and Bill wasn't having it. He remembered those still Sundays in Vermont with Grandpa Griffith where they would go to church. And Grandpa Griffith was a real Vermonter. He didn't want anybody telling him how he must believe. He knew that there was a God, but he didn't want to be told how to believe. And Bill struggles with this idea of a God-based solution, doesn't he, in Bill's story. And finally, Ebby says to him, why don't you choose your own conception of God? which he got from Sam Shoemaker at the Cavalry Mission. Now, the, the Oxford group was a bunch of people practicing Christianity, but Sam Shoemaker knew that sometimes people just need to have their own conception of that God. Now, what sold it for Bill? It says, I saw, I felt, I believed. I saw a recovered, a recovered alcoholic who was not drinking and happy in his release. I saw, I felt. What did he feel? He felt hope. What did he believe? 
that God could and would if he were sought. I saw, I felt, I believe. What's the next line? Thus was I convinced. And that's the first time in the chapter that the word convinced and God are used to join Bill. He's convinced that God could do for him what he could not do for himself. There was no more power in Bill than there was in my friend at that moment. And that was none at all. How did I begin my relationship with God? <clears throat> By ruling out every other possibility. I saw at Swedish Covenant Hospital, I saw at the meetings that I was going to, that there were people in those rooms that were recovering, and I was not. And so I didn't get struck with faith, and I didn't get struck with willingness. And I finally got abstinent in Eugene, Oregon years later because I stopped doing the work. But when I got abstinent 21 years ago, what I saw were people just like the people I had seen in Chicago. They were not drinking. There is no OA. When I lived in Eugene, Oregon, there was no such thing as OA. They had AA and Al-Anon and NA, but they didn't have OA there at that time. Now I think they do. I'm not sure. But anyway, I started taking action after action that I did not even yet believe in, but I saw that it was working in other people. And so if you're wondering today or you're a sponsor today and you're trying to help somebody get started, start taking action. Forget willingness, forget faith, forget all that stuff. Begin taking action after action after action. What do I mean by action after action? A, put down the food. B, start praying and start working the steps. Start helping others. If you're not at step 12 yet, be helpful. Get your butt to meetings. Be there about five, 10 minutes early. Stay about five, 10 minutes late. Dr. Bob said, this is about love and service. Stick your hand out and say, hi, I'm Harlan. Welcome. I've never seen you here before. Can I get you a big book? Can I, whatever it is, or just be there and be pleasant. That's a start. That's a start. Go to the meeting and be pleasant and shut up about all the things you don't have and all the people that have it easier than you. Forget that. For, for an hour and 20 minutes, forget that, at least. Take action. And then the willingness came, and the faith builds. And it builds every time I take that action. The Wright brothers' almost childish faith that they could build a machine which would fly was the mainspring of their accomplishment. In other words, the Wright brothers believed that they could do it. There were scientists, Dr. Langley, there were scientists that proved that nothing built of man could fly. Every attempt had failed. There were people that had advanced degrees in physics and chemistry and science of all kinds that could not make an airplane fly. But these two bicycle repairmen they were bicycle repairmen from Dayton, Ohio. And they went out to North Carolina to take advantage of the wind that was coming in off the ocean. And they went to a place called Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, and they made their plane fly for 33 seconds. Changed the world. Where did it start? It started in their belief that they could. There are many people that love to go to the ocean when we go to the OA birthday in Los Angeles. I'm so sad we're not going to be in LA because I so look forward to this every year. We have such a good time. And there are people, they get up and they go out to the Pacific Ocean and they have a, 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 a meeting out there. 
on the, on the, not in the water, but on the water, they have a meeting and it's wonderful. And they come back and they say, what a miracle, what a miracle. We saw the ocean and we saw this and we saw that. That's great and that, that's fine. But a miracle that I'm looking at has no explanation. Something that occurs that doesn't have explanation. What is that? It's the people in that hotel that are compulsive overeaters, biologically damned to eat themselves to death, that are not eating compulsively, and they are happy in their release. I'm wearing clothing that I bought at a regular store. What a miracle. I bought these clothes, the pants, these, I'm wearing shorts because it's still warm here. I bought these at Walmart. I bought pants at Walmart. Are you kidding me? Walmart wouldn't, would, would, they'd have to sew four of them together. I bought, no, I didn't buy that. This shirt was actually a gift, but any, just bear with me. I have shirts in this house that I bought online that are Cubs t-shirts or Ducks t-shirts. They deliver it and it's fine. Or I buy them at Walmart or I buy them in a men's store. I buy clothes that everybody else can access. It's not lost on me. I have a car. I never got stuck in it. My stomach doesn't touch the steering wheel. I used to have the cleanest steering wheel in Chicago. Why? Because my stomach rubbed up, my lower stomach rubbed up against the steering wheel. And if I wore light colored pants, the black from the steering wheel, would there'd be a ring on my pants on the lower stomach, the lower extension of the stomach. That's a miracle. I, now, I don't think there are movies now, are there? I don't think so. But anyway, if I wanted to, I could go to the movies and I could sit in the seat. I couldn't go to the movies for 20 years, 25 years. I couldn't go to a show because the seats at the, at the show, I couldn't fit in them. I couldn't, I'd have to sit on one cheek and then I'd sit on the other cheek and I'd get numb because you know, there was so much pressure, it wouldn't let the blood flow. I'd get numb, my feet, my legs would fall asleep. That, that's not enjoyable to me. That's not enjoyable to me, sitting there like that. Plus it would cost me $60, $70 to go to the show. 10 to get in and 50 on the shit, on the food, sorry, on the food. So I couldn't go to the show for many, many, many years. Excuse me for one second. So I hope that we're joining these various things together of the action and the main object of this book being to help you find a power greater than yourself, which will solve your problem. Let's continue. Without that, now when they say without that, they mean without the childish attitude that these two bicycle repairmen had that they could succeed. Without that, nothing could have happened. We agnostics and atheists were sticking to the idea that self-sufficiency would solve our problems. I had a stomach that came down almost to my knees. I had a stomach that came down almost to my knees. I weighed 335 pounds as a senior at Mather High School in Chicago. By the time I was a sophomore in college, 500 pounds. I went to a school in downtown Chicago that had elevators. And there was a man and a woman that got off the elevator once because they were afraid there was too much weight in the elevator. And they said one to the other, with that guy in the red shirt, I don't think this elevator is safe. There's too much weight. And they got off. I heard them. I heard them. I would rather they stuck a dagger in my throat or in my eye. It would have hurt less. 
but I was still going to do this on my own. Oh, you don't have to tell me about OA and all that. I got this. Who in the hell was I kidding? I was a circus sideshow. What did I have? Nothing. The only thing I had was I knew how to stack a plate at a buffet where all the real good stuff is inside and there was lettuce and salad on the outside so that you'd think I was eating a salad. That was my greatest skill in life. Top of 53. When others showed us that God's sufficiency worked with them, we began to feel like those who had insisted the rights would never fly. Logic is great stuff. We liked it. We still like it. It is not by chance we were given the power to reason, to examine the evidence of our senses, and to draw conclusions. This, that is one of man's magnificent attributes. We agnostically inclined would not feel satisfied with a proposal which does not lend itself to reasonable approach and interpretation. Hence, we are at pains to tell why we think our present faith is reasonable, why we think it is more sane and logical to believe than not to believe, why we say our former thinking was soft and mushy when we threw up our hands in doubt and said, we don't know. How's your way working? How's your way working? You know, I get people calling me all the time. If you're a sponsor, pay attention to this. I get people calling me all the time, and the first thing they want to tell me is they want to give me their resume. They've been in AA, they've been in NA, they've been in al they've been in CODA, they've been here, they've been there, they were on the Bozo Circus, they've been on Garfield Goose. They have the resume out the window, and that's why they don't have to do this and they don't have to do that, and they don't have to study this and they don't have to study that. And I always tell them the same thing. If those things worked so well for you, we wouldn't be having this conversation. And you're going to have to set that aside because everything you think you know is what's killing you. What you think you know will kill you. Chances are excellent that we are all, including me, thinking we know certain things that are not true. And I have to say that set-aside prayer. What is the set-aside prayer? God, help me set aside everything I think I know about you, the big book, and recovery. Very simple. Help me set aside everything I think I know about you, the big book, and recovery. You can phrase it any way you want to. You don't have to ask me what's the set-aside prayer. You can make up your own. Make up your own. God, help me set aside everything I think I know about any, whatever. Because what I think I know is killing me. When we became alcoholics, middle of 33, crushed by a self-imposed crisis, we could not postpone or evade. We had to fearlessly face the proposition that either God is everything or else he is nothing. God either is or he isn't. What is our choice to be? And this is the guts of the agnostic temperament. Sponsors, pay attention. God is or he isn't. He can't be God when it comes to food, but not God when it comes to a marriage. He can't be God when it comes to a marriage and not about children. He can't be God when it comes to food, but not about my mother-in-law or my father-in-law or my, what am I, next door neighbor, whatever the heck that is. He either is or he isn't. What is our choice to be? Agnostic without knowledge. Agnostic means I'm not sure if he's going to help me in this area. I'm not sure if he's there. I'm not sure. I just, I don't have enough knowledge. I test God and he's there. Doctors have been pronouncing me dead from the time I was a teenager. I was 17 years old and I broke my ankle in gym class. And my mother took me to Edgewater Hospital 
It's not, Edgewater Hospital isn't even a hospital anymore. I think it's condos. But anyway, and Dr. Bernstein, Max Bernstein, he looked over his glasses just like this. And he said, you know, Virginia, he was very angry. My mother's name was Virginia. You don't hear that name anymore. And it's not a name you hear. You know, Virginia, he isn't going to live to see 30. He's over 300 pounds and he's 17 years old. That's what he told my mother. And my mother started crying in the emergency room at Edgewater Hospital. And we went for ice cream on Devon Avenue on the way home to kill the pain. My mother was a compulsive overeater, as was I, with a vow that the next day we would start on our diets, which, of course, never happened. God is or he is not. What is our choice to be? I'm still alive. I'm 66 years old. I may not live to see tomorrow. I couldn't tell you. But here's what I can tell you. Six days last week, I walked three miles, and it took me 90 minutes to do it. I'm not exactly a speed demon, but I finish six days a week. I walk three miles. Six days, five days a week, excuse me, five days a week, I walk a thousand yards in the swimming pool at the JCC by my house in Scottsdale against the resistance of the water. I walk 1,000 yards to strengthen my legs. I can breathe. There are some of you on the line this morning that would know when I was sitting and the sweat would be pouring off of me. I'm not sweating and I'm not breathing like that. So I'm alive. I can't tell the future. I could go in my sleep tonight. I couldn't tell you. But here's what I can tell you. Because of my faith, and because of the actions that I took, I have lived. Because before I wasn't living, that's not living. Most of the adults that I knew as a child were out of the concentration camps. And they had seen the horrors. And they had seen humanity, and I use that term because there is no other term to use, they had seen humanity at its worst. They had witnessed firsthand the greatest crime against human beings ever perpetrated. And they would grab my face and they would say, live until you die. Live until you die. And when they first told that to me, I thought that the only way to live until I die was to eat as many Almond Joy bars as I could, because that was living. I loved Almond Joy bars. That was living, man. No, it doesn't mean that at all. What it means is all of us are going to die, no matter whether we're in the disease or in recovery, we're going to die. But can I live before I die so that when I die, I can know I have lived? And my life in the food wasn't living. It was death. It was an existence that I wouldn't wish on anyone. I have known the sweet feeling of being alive. You have a toolkit at your feet that gives you the secret of the universe on how to live until you die. You don't have to live as a slave to food. You don't have to be sitting on the amusement park bench while your grandchildren ride on the roller coaster. You can ride with them. You don't have to be a spectator of life anymore. No matter how young or old you are, you can join in on life. You have to work these steps like your hair is on fire. And if you do that, you will find that if you test God, he will be there for you in ways you cannot imagine. Test him. See where you can find him lacking. You cannot. 
he will be there, she will be there, it will be there. It doesn't matter whether you are a believer or an atheist, whether you are an anorexic, whether you are a compulsive overeater, whether you are a restrictor, whether you are black or white or green or Jew or Gentile or straight or gay or short or tall, God will be there. Bill Wilson, Dr. Bob were drunks and they live their life sober because of these steps, and you can too. Okay, as is, I used to have this where I would go till 11.15, and there is a part of me that wants to cover a couple of more paragraphs, but since I'm seeing that, that the other way works better, um, when we're, now we're going to stop and I'm going to write down where we are, and that's where we're going to pick up next.